What's going on YouTube? Welcome back to Living Life Fast. Today is going to be a car history video. I'm going to go through all the cars I've ever owned, starting from when I first passed my test, all the way up until my current car, the E92 M3. You guys requested it, so I'd recommend you guys get some popcorn, maybe finish off watching these standards, clean your house. I don't know what it is you've got to do, but I'll see you in a minute. Before we start the video, please smash the like button. Also, if you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing. And if you want to stay up to date with Living Life Fast, press the bell icon, which means you'll be notified the moment I upload a video. Okay, so guys, I'm going to try to keep this video as brief as possible. I've had a few practice takes, but this is definitely going to be a long video. I may possibly do a part one and a part two, but like I say, I will try to keep it as brief as possible. Maybe talk more on the high performance cars. I've owned and some of the cars that sort of have stuck with me, ones that I've got memories of. So I'll start off by telling you when I first passed my driving test, which was September the 11th of 2007. Uh, I was 19 years old at the time. I'm now 30, which means I've been driving for over 10 years. So my first official legitimate, you know, with my license was a Volkswagen Polo. It was a 1.4 16 valve that had 100 bhp, five speed manual finished in black. Uh, it was like a second generation Polo. I think it might have been like a 99 plate if I remember correctly, not too sure. But yeah, really loved this car. Cost me about two, three grand. And before I even passed my test, I knew I was gonna buy the Polo. Uh, I even ordered a set of wheels. Uh, they were called Melba. Oh shit. I also purchased a set of alloys. I think they were called Melba Retros. They were like the BBS, um, RS, uh, LM style alloys. At the time, all my friends were like V-dubbers, uh, so they had the, like the deep dish style wheels, and I bought them. They weren't replicas, but they were like that style. The real deal with the BBS, but obviously they were like two, three grand wheels, but um, I had them sitting in my room for months before I had even bought the car. I also had a sound system as well. I took up my whole of my boot, literally. It was like 3,000 watt sub. It was just insane. I had an Audi uh, like style black front like mesh grille. Uh, what happened with that car was one of the gears went, so it turned into a four speed from a five speed. And then I think two months in, somebody crashed into the back of me. Car was still mint, like even after somebody going into the back of me, uh, it was completely fine. And then what happened was one day it was wet, being young and stupid. I was handbraking it, handbrakes around the corner, I give it the opposite lock. You know, I understood a bit about like oversteer and stuff like that. Um, you know, caught the slide, went to straighten it up as I'm exiting the corner. And just like I mentioned the other day when I went live on YouTube about the R8 experience, some of you remember, um, the same thing happened. I thought I had the wheel straight as I'm powering out of the corner, but unfortunately the wheels are facing the other way. And I literally, as the car gripped, it just, snapped straight into a parked car so yeah whatever you want to call it shit driver um yeah young and stupid so yeah wrote that off heartbroken uh got it towed back and then yeah uh, i ended up getting a payout uh, from a claim because of the person that went into the back of me and i also got paid out by the insurance i got paid like four grand i think for the car so i had about seven grand the second car i owned was called a bmw 318 ti uh ti i think stands for compact so it was an e36 3 series with the back chopped so they look a bit funny they're not everybody's cup of tea uh, i mean i personally like them but this one the previous owner had actually supercharged so this car was running i think like uh, roughly 200 bhp uh, this was a really really quick car i mean i was 19 at the time but this car was wicked it had a genuine ac snitcher kit in it i'll try to pull pictures up for you now um, it didn't have the ac snitcher wheels but it had the ac snitcher exhaust uh, what else did I have? I had the spoiler on the rear boot and it had it on the top of the windscreen, uh, back of the window, sorry. And uh, yeah, it was, uh, oh yeah, it also had the mirrors as well. It was just a wicked car, man. It was my first rear wheel drive car. And it's a car that I did get a little used to, you know, stepping the rear end out. It was really snappy on the rear because it was such, uh, so short. Uh, it wasn't the most controllable car, no LSD, but it was a complete rocket. Uh, I mean, for a 19 year old, I was keeping up with VR6s and VR6s even to today's standards are very quick cars. The supercharger was uh, similar to the ones were, that were installed on the C200 compressors. I think they're called uh, uh, Eaton Supercharger. Uh, but yeah, really cool car. Owned that for about a month. Uh, what happened to that then? So uh, I was on the motorway chasing a Z3M Coupe. So the Z3M Coupe obviously has the M3, E36 M3 engine in, the later 
uh, year Model 1s uh, had the E46 M3 engine in so I was getting completely gapped on the motorway I was doing a thing and um, what happened was uh, like I said the car was completely killing me I was just on him uh, M4 and what happened was I just remember driving and all of a sudden there was no power in the car and I'm like what's going on looked in my rear window think of the speed I'm traveling the whole motorway was black covered in black thick black smoke like uh, like the the type of smoke you see in fires like and it looked like a desert storm like managed to roll it off the motorway all the way back to near my house like about two three corners away and lifts up the bonnet i'm just fuming i'm like oh my god like you know second car gone we're looking over the engine we're like you know what's happened and all of a sudden you know where you fill up your engine or you know the the, the engine cap the oil cap it's gone bang it's just flown into the sky when i say this thing sounded like a magnum like it just sounded like a gun went off this thing flew into the sky and did not come down that thing's still still up in the sky now i'm telling you like I'm sitting there with my mate and i'm like yo we was just hovering our face over it like that would have went through my face like not hit it it would have went through it i actually went and bought an m3 engine after chasing the z3 m coupe went and bought an m3 engine put it in the car never completed the project um, don't know why, but um, that would have been a really cool project. That car disappeared, a long story with that car to be honest. So my next car, and this was uh, um, uh, one of my first proper cars, do you know what I mean? Uh, it was a first generation Audi S3, finished in Dolphin Grey. And uh, when I say this car was mint, it was just 10 out of 10. Like I said, first proper car. Uh, I remember the number plate YG53 TFN, it was the last um, year model of uh, when they went out of production. I remember the day I bring the car back All of my mates were trying to buy it off me like literally I got uh, like no lie I got offered a thousand pound on top to just sell it to one of my mates straight away and I was like nah, no way like, I've searched for this car man. It was completely mint like white levers It was the 225 brake version. So you had I think the 210 or 215 brake This was the 225 had the eight spoke style alloys just immaculate like it was just the baddest car I'd owned like and uh, it had uh, tints, I had the windows tinted on there. I had the Bose sound system, which was brilliant anyway, but mine, I upgraded all of the front speakers, the tweeters, the door car speakers, and I even had a nice smart uh, sub put in. It had a built-in amp, so nothing crazy, just a nice tidy one in the corner. So it was my first time in an Audi, um, and I was a bit paranoid at first. All my friends, like I said, they were V-dubbers, and they were like, nah, get the Audi. It was winter at the time, so the Quattro system. When I first bought it, it was like understeering out of corner. I was like, why is it understeering? I was like, gunning my mates, like, you made me buy an S3, um, you know, four-wheel drive for the winter, and it's like understeering like it was front-wheel drive. Three months in, I'm like really getting pissed off about it now, and I've uh, took it into a garage, uh, AVIT, basically found out that the whole deck system wasn't even working. It was actually, driving as a front wheel drive car, could not believe it. So had the Holdex uh, ECU, I think it was, that got replaced in it. And uh, after that, it was night and day. It was like four wheel drive now. Obviously front BIOS, but you can feel like the difference now, like when you attack a roundabout, for example, you feel it gluing at the back. And a lot of people like to diss Audis, like they understeer, uh, which mine was at the start, but you really have to drive these cars hard to get it to that kind of, uh, level you know you there, there's driving on the limit but then there's driving past that limit do you know what I mean and that's where I find Audi's uh, you know quattros they start to break down you know um, on the limit they're fine you won't never be understeering in real world conditions they're perfect they're very capable cars but when you start pushing them out of their limits they start to they start to um, lose composure and uh, I've experienced it many times with, with even my S3. I know it's an older car, the newer cars are a bit different, but even my mate's RS, like like I said, there's, there's, there's driving on the limit, but then there's this other level that isn't a recommended way of driving. Uh, it's a bit stupid, but when you start pushing them to this kind of level, that's when you find the Audi's a bit weird. They kind of snap from the rear. And then like, um, even my S3, I was pushing it, I was chasing a, a, a Mark V or Mark VI uh, two liter TDI. And I was going around a roundabout quite fast in the wet, but it just snapped from the rear. Like, it's weird. Like, not many of you would have probably experienced this, but if you remember the game uh, on PlayStation called Juiced, there was a trick called the boomerang. Like, some of you certain gamers will know what I'm on about. And, like, you used to have to, it was like a boomerang, literally. It would go sideways 
And then like, boom, like bring it back straight. So yeah, it was weird. Even my mate's RS4, Gov, I always go on about him. Cause we, like, I've, he's had that car for a long time. And um, even his RS4, when he drives the shit out of it, that car, don't understeer, it dangerously goes into an oversteer and it's almost a bit uncontrollable. But anyway, guys, I'm waffling on right now. Yeah, so I remember selling the car. It was the first car I was actually upset about selling as well, man. I was like, wow, I'm actually getting a bit emotional with the guy driving off. Like, I'm watching him drive down the road in the S3 because it was the longest car I owned. It was well over a year as well, that car. What was the next car? I think the next car after that, I think it was the E36 M3. So it was a convertible, a blue convertible E36 M3. Had the hard top with it as well. Buying this car was a real achievement, although some would say that it wasn't as good as the S3. You know, it was like a 95 or 96 maybe. I don't even know the year, but like I told you, my dad owned the E36 M3. So when I bought mine, it was like, yes, I'm actually in the car now that I grew up in. Although it was a convertible, uh, slightly more heavier, but uh, loved it to death, man. First like proper rear wheel drive car that you know with a limited slip diff i remember it had ac snitcher style wheels i think they were replicas uh, the calipers were painted yellow the angel lights were blue at the front weren't too cheesy like it probably would look cheesy now but it wasn't that bad at the time one thing i, I can say is that it was sitting really low you know convertible m3s or even freezes that always sit really low i don't know if it's because they carry so much extra weight but uh, this car, yeah, every time I put my foot down, it would rub in the arches. The tyres would literally scrape. I just thought it was because it was lowered. Um, and one time I took it into the garage and I found out all my shocks were gone on the car. Yeah, I had to have all the shocks changed. I mean, yeah, loved that car to death. Roof down, had the windows tinted. It was such a manageable car because when you drive these later M cars or these cars of current gen, uh, they're so much more powerful. So when you start drifting, you have to really back off the throttle. Obviously, you give it loads of revs to get it into the drift. Um, but it's not like the older cars where you got like 300 bhp like you can with these cars you can use like 75% of the throttle when drifting you really gotta get on the power you know otherwise you're not gonna get it out you know it ended up part exchanging the e36 m3 for a 530i so it was the e39 traveled all the way to bristol kind of got fed up with the m3 felt like i wanted something a bit more luxurious something a bit more comfortable uh, this was the 530i it was a automatic so actually before i mention me picking it up on the way there i'm in the m3 with three people in the car and um, i'm about two corners away from the the owner of the 530i and uh, i'm with my mates and i'm going guys come let me just hit the last drift in the car you know last corner two streets away not even two streets i think one street away hit the roundabout and obviously i've got loads of people in the car so i'll give it like extra revs obviously because it's only like 286 300 brake i think it is so i've had to give it extra revs drop the clutch gone around the roundabout spun it out i'm almost going sideways like literally the dash collapsed on the car so literally my steering wheel's like diagonal like this and um luckily i was with one guy called dean we call him dean with a spanner he just can fix anything sort it out put some tape get a cable ties fixed it all up up to the owner and then i got my bad luck now so i picked up my 530i part exchange it with um, the guy on the way back not even 10 minutes i'm driving it i've gone to the kfc drive through and the car is overheating there's smoke coming out the bonnet can you believe this rang the guy up i'm like what are you doing like what's going on sort of thing you know like kind of get the argument at this point and he's like oh you know uh, I'm back at work now, there's nothing I'm gonna do. And luckily the guy I was with, I mean, I would have never given. in. I would have went back and waited or whatever I had to do. But the guy I was with told me, uh, Dean, he said that now nah, the car's fine. It's just um, the cooling. Like uh, with the 530i's, the E36 gen and the E39, they, they used to suffer with cooling problems. There used to be some, I don't know exactly what it is, but there was something plastic that used to break away. And uh, they were quite. Uh, it was quite a common fault with those generation cars. So um, yeah, got back, loved that car, man. That's another car that I was doing a lot of drifting in because it was winter at the time. It was finished in like a mint green. I had my sound system put in that as well. I really loved it, man. Liked the uh, rocket style exhaust on it. I even see it the other day, actually. Someone was driving it the other day. And I mean, this is like, you're talking seven years, like. So yeah, I ended up selling the 530i um, to somebody. I remember taking my sound system out of the car. The next decent car I remember was the Focus ST. I remember I was about, 24 i think when i had that uh, it was the st3 lv 06 f so it was the it was a 2006 model i mean i love the looks of it but i didn't like how it drove for the first two weeks after two three weeks of driving it 
I began to love the car. This is why I always try to say to you guys, be careful with who you listen to on the internet for car reviews, because a first impressions is a first impressions, which is why I title a video of first impressions. It don't mean it's a fact. Like, like I said, I hated my Focus ST when I first drove it. But after two, three weeks, it, it, it's like you learn how to drive a car, you adapt to the style of driving. I was used to driving the M3 and like, you know, the Audi. So it was my first proper front wheel drive car. But this car was, you know, one of my main cars. I had this for four years, the longest time I've ever owned a car. I absolutely loved it. Everything you could think uh, modification wise, I did to it apart from big turbos externally. Um, you know, I had satin black wheels. I had my initials customized, uh, sprayed into the, the, the center caps. The calipers I had done uh, sprayed blue with the Ford uh, uh, logo. I had a uh, full exhaust system. I had the face lifted lights put on. I had it tinted all around. I sent it to a specialist lighting company to have like uh, lights put under the, the handles, all inside the footwells. I sent it to Dream Science to get it stage free tuned. I know a lot of you say that stage one, two, three, it's all bollocks. But basically I had an intercooler. It had a uh, full induction, um, it had a, a really aggressive tune uh, by Dream Science called Mod X. Honestly, a stupidly fast car, man. Love that car to death. Everyone loved that car as well. Uh, had it uh, lowered on Ibac Springs as well. And it just sat so nice, man. One of my best cars. Like, yeah. I personally only remember only being beaten once ever in that car. And that was by Audi S4, like uh, the, the Bi Turbo 2.7. Uh, I used to kill C63s, I used to kill, e annihilate E92 M3. This is why you see me in my E92 M3 now, I know like, you know, what can keep out of it and what it can't sort of thing. And um, the turbos, when they kick in on, uh, on a Mod X tuned, a uh, Dream Science tuned Focus ST, they're off because they've got T5, the Volvo 2.5 turbo engine in it. So they're from the Volvos, which means they're really torquey. And once you tune them, um, they extract uh, quite a lot of performance. So 315 bhp, but about close to 400 foot pounds of torque. Uh, so most turbo cars, you know, you get like after a tune, it's like 300 brake and then similar torque figures. But this was like nearly 100 foot pounds more torque. Um, seriously, seriously capable car. Definitely a car I'd recommend anybody buying. Solid, never had an issue in four years of owning it. Never, like not one issue. Like, sorry, of small things, niggly things, but I mean, the way you see how I drive, I hammered this car for the whole time. Engine mounts was one thing uh, that got upgraded on it, but I mean, honestly, like the, the reliability, the, the pops and bangs the car used to make, uh, the gearbox, the best manual gearbox, one of the best gearbox you can get in, in a manual car. Ended up selling that to a friend uh, who sold it to another person who wrote it off within four days of ownership not even four days i had police come to my house because the car was still registered registered in my name it was like not that long sold so sold the focus st next car that springs to mind an audi a6 it was a 2011 2.7 i think it was like a le mans version it was like in a minty star green as well uh, really nice daily driver but then the next high performance car i remember was a, no, actually, I owned the E46 M3 for about two, three months. So although, yeah, I was drifting a lot in the E36, the E46 was the car that, because I was a bit older now, I had a bit more experience in cars and I really did get the grips of getting the rear end out. I weren't like drifting, like roundabouts and stuff, but I was hitting corners and I just felt really com uh, confident in it because obviously the E46 is a brilliant car to drift. It power slid so nicely, had the perfect amount of power Convertible as well with the hard top, um, red levers, immaculate condition this car was. Was a bit funny the E46, like when you was driving at high speed, you could be holding the wheel straight, but the car would like wonder, like it was really weird what it used to do. Ended up selling that to one of my friends. And um, that's when I got into my, one of my all time favorite cars I ever owned, which was a Renault Megane Cup 250. So yeah, Renault Megane Cup 250. This was um, definitely, even now, I'd say my top three. Top two, I'd say, probably my second. Yeah, definitely top three. Uh, definitely my favorite hot hatch um, today because I'm a person who likes a driver focused uh, car. And the Megane Cup 250, I don't know why more people don't drive these cars or own them. Like To me, the Megane Cup 
is like the M3 of the um, hatchback world. Do you know what I mean? It's it's a real driver focused package. The interior is like in CSL as well. It's you know it's 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 just like in between. Do you know what I mean? It's got that slight bit of comfort, but it's like real hardcore. Do you know what I mean? And uh, it looks so nice in my opinion. Black with the black wheels, uh, red Brembo calipers. It's a nice looking car, you know. Um, it really was a head turner as well. Uh, owning that, I had that for quite a while as well. I had a private plate on it, SN10 Triple R. But yeah, uh, one of the best handling cars I've owned. Uh, the Focus ST, when you used to get the Focus ST on its limit, it would only ever understeer. The Megan was the opposite. When you got it on its limit, it never pushed wide, it never understeered. What would actually happen is you would just let off the throttle just a little bit and the back, it would just tuck in so much more. Um, quite dangerous if you're not used to the rear end uh, coming out on cars. It can be a dangerous car because if you're going too fast and you let off the throttle, uh, the back would completely go sideways. Like, I know, you know, I am talking about driving stupid here. Uh, you know, under normal driving conditions, you know, just driving on the limit, having a bit of fun, it won't happen. But if you really, really, really push that car, the back swings out on it, man. And it's, it's uh, like I say, if you like driving, it's, it's a fun thing because you can drive faster. But it's a car that you have to stay on the power. So when you're going around fast corners and stuff like that, you really have to keep the power down. You need to keep the back down. Uh, whereas the Focus ST didn't do that. It was just safe at all times. Limitations were a lot shorter, but... The Megane, man, honestly, it was like driving an M3. Like, you know how edgy and how precise it is. It's an adjustable car on the limit. I think it had a limited slip diff as well. Unbelievable, the Megane. One of my all-time favorite. I even had it chipped as well. Oh, I just wanted a bit more there. Only 250 bhp. Uh, took it to Super Chips. Obviously, if I wanted a proper tune, I'd have went to somewhere like a Volvo. The Super Chips was perfect. I think it bumped it up to about 300, 310 bhp. Made it really, really quick. If there's any car that I'd recommend, the Focus ST for high performance, if you want an all out beast, that just like a drag style car, Focus ST. If you want a driver focused car, the Megan, 100%. They're so cheap now as well. Ended up selling the Megan. Um, the next car, what did I have after that? Like what comes, what springs to mind is the 335D. I think it was the E92 335D uh, was the next car. Yeah, E92 335D finished in space gray. It had the M-Tech kit on it, two rocket style exhausts. Car that I always wanted to own. It was a 2011, beautiful red levers. Um, I think, no, I didn't even have it tinted actually. Such a fast car. It's actually the, the, the shortest amount of time I've owned a car as well. Uh, ridiculous performance. So I actually purchased the car with the intention to keep it, you know, fast diesel, uh, economical, but you know, keep up with M3s at the same time. After two days, I had it uh, tuned by DMS. I had them come out to me and tune it. It was a complete monster after the tune. Uh, so much of a monster that I just, I couldn't cruise the car no more. Like it was so teasing. Like even in sixth gear, you put your foot down, it was like a spaceship. Like it was just gone like sixth gear but the problem i had with it is with me i'm i've always been like a, a, a an aggressive style driver it was impossible to cruise in my opinion uh, which meant the fuel economy was rubbish i may as well have bought a 335i what uh, finalized me selling it was the fact that i filled up the tank in one day and uh, i was just doing normal missions around town whatever i was doing and i used the whole tank in one day and i'm sitting there thinking this is a 335d I was supposed to be doing like 40, 45 miles, and I'm, I've done a whole tank. So, and I know that they are capable. Like, if you take them on longer trips and you, you're not as bad as me, um, you'll be fine. Like, they are quite fuel efficient. But and on top of that, not having a petrol engine sound was a bit of a bummer as well. Um, I'm used to like hearing that naturally aspirated or that turbocharged engine, you know, petrol. And this car, I mean, for a diesel, beautiful sounding car, but. You know, when you're used to driving M3s, the, the, the 35D is not cutting it in the sound department. Um, but yeah, uh, nothing bad to say about it, just that I bought it with the intentions of fuel economy in mind. And I just come to the conclusion that I may as well have bought a 35i. So I literally got rid of it in about three weeks of owning it. So yeah, sold the 335D. I think the next car, yeah, I was in a Mark IV GT TDI. I was like, you know what, let me just keep it efficient for a bit, blend in a bit. Um, you know, Mark IV GT TDI, it was blue. Man, perfect car, man. Like, if you want a nice, cheap, uh, reliable daily runner, like Gov's uh, silver one, 
GCTDI, man, can't go wrong. I actually sold the GCTDI and had another Mark IV GCTDI, actually. Yeah, I've had, I've had loads of GCTDIs, to be honest. After that, I remember having an Audi A3 uh, S line. It was a white one. No, sorry, I had a Seat Exeo. Yeah, so many cars, I told you guys, man, it's ridiculous. Yeah, I had a Seat Exeo, I've still got that now, my mum drives it. I had an A A3 S line, uh, 190 TDI or 2 litre TDI, whatever it is. Really nice, had tints on it. Uh, really love that car. Beautiful daily driver, man. Really nice. 2014, uh, 2014 plate that was. When I had the A3, the S line, I had actually already ordered a Golf R, the Mark 7 Golf R uh, on lease. Waited six months for that car. Uh, obviously, you lot have all seen the review. The, the video's nearly got a million views. Uh, definitely one of my all time favourite cars as well. Uh, as an all round car, don't think you can really touch it. Um, don't really need to talk much about it. Fully spec'd, panoramic roof, had the upgraded Patrols, the 19 inch alloy wheels, had the Dynamo upgraded sound system, had the bigger sat navigation, uh, the black leather interior, DSG as an all round package. Very, very difficult to beat at the time. They were offering very good prices on them. Uh, under £200, I think at one point you could pick up a Golf R for about £180 a month. If you left it in base form, obviously, um, I ended up specking mine, so I may as well have bought any car. It ended up being five fifty a month for the Golf R. Such a nice feeling owning a brand spanking new car. Uh, I was actually working in a family restaurant at the time. Brilliant, brilliant car, man. Uh, what do I say, man? I'm kind of lost for for words right now. So unlike the S3 I owned before, I, I mentioned like you know when you got them onto their limit, they didn't perform too well. Uh, the Golf R I found was a little different. So. Um, for starters, it's the first the Volkswagen slash Audi that you could fully disable the stability control. And what I discovered was when you started pushing it, even in the real world, like like I told you, I am a bit crazy in my driving. Um, but when you really push the Golf R um, like out of control almost, um, you found out that you found that the car was a very balanced car. It was almost like the M3. It was you know adjustable on the limit, uh, whereas. I've found that Audis ain't ever been that well balanced when you push it to that extreme. The Golf R, even now, I jumped into uh, the white Golf R you see a little while ago, I took the video down, but like, I sit there and think I I lie like when I say things, but when I jumped into the white Golf R, it reconfirmed what, what I said about the Golf R in my review. It really is a brilliant car. Um, similar to, to, to every other Audi uh, Volkswagen product, not the most feedback from the wheel, but definitely the most adjustable and capable uh, um, Volkswagen ever produced. So um, at the same time as owning the Golf R, I actually owned a Nissan GTR as well. So I owned a Golf R and a GTR at the same time, which was complete craziness. Like my friend was uh, trying to sell me his C63. Uh, I was like, nah, I don't want it. Then basically he goes, one of my other friends, one of his other friends has got a Nissan GTR. And I was a bit interested in that. Uh, took me for a test drive, let me drive the car now. And you know, you got certain people out there that they spend their money on clothes, luxury things drugs, alcohol, whatever it is. With me, you put a car in front of me and let me put my foot down, that's like my drug, innit? I'm an idiot for even driving it because uh, when I drove it, I was like, I lost my mind that how ridiculous the acceleration was. I mean, it does it so easy, like, um, you just put your foot down and it's, it's, yeah, it's unbelievable. You lot heard me when I went live not long ago, the GTR is. It's, it's a serious car, man. Like, once I drove it, I was like, yeah, it's mine, I'm taking it. Definitely a car I pray that I own again one day. And, you know, I owned that car for about seven months, went, took it for a service and ended up costing about four grand. They were trying to charge six grand for a service on it because there was gearbox uh, gearbox problem with it. So service was about 1,200 pound. Uh, they ended up telling me that there was something, filings or something like metal filings in the gearbox oil, which meant, I'm not sure if it was a solenoid that needed replacing, but Ended up turning into like a three, four grand bill. The guys rang me again saying that, yo, you need to change something else in the gearbox. And I thought that the guy's kind of taking a piss now. But yeah, after that, I didn't get that change. I just ended up selling it. They all suffer with gearbox issues, by the way. So every GTR owner kind of knows what it is. They rattle uh, the bell housings. It's a factory fault. So it's a design fault from factory. You can upgrade the bell housing, which takes the rattle away a little bit. You can also install circlips or something like that, which removes, I think it's like some kind of magnet removes the filing. I'm not too sure, don't don't quote me on that. You know, you'd think because it's four wheel drive that, you know, it's a bit more numb, not as much feedback, 
uh, does all the work for you but no let me tell you the g-chart is not that it's not an audi i'm not trying to disrespect an audi like i said already the audi is a very capable car in the real world you're killing most people but the only problem i find with the audi is you just don't get much feedback from the steering wheel when you're holding it it's like you're holding a soulless car like i'm not not trying to take the piss i'm just telling you facts that you don't get much feedback that's why people like m cars because you can feel the road a little bit more newer um m cars they're not as uh you know you don't get as much feedback as the previous gen m, uh, m cars but they still do a better job of of like an rs4 for example but the nissan gtr is not your typical four wheel drive car this car is different you can feel what's going on it's really adjustable in the right. limit no this car is precise like it's like a big m3 you feel like you're driving a racing car and uh, what's so great about that car is i never had that gtr on limits and i drove the shit out of it i never heard the tire screech on it it really was an unbelievable experience it's like, like playing need for speed or gran turismo when you when you drive that car definitely up there uh, gtr Megane Cup, two of my favourite cars without fail, um, very driver focused car, the GTR was obviously super capable. So because of the gearbox problems with the GTR and the fact I got um, such a big bill on it, uh, I ended up part exchanging it for the F80 M3 and obviously at the same time I had the Golf R on lease. I've had to chat to a friend and he kind of helped me, like he rented it out for me sort of thing. And yeah, so I got rid of the GTR, got rid of the Golf R and now I'm in an M3, and uh, the F80 M3, sorry. I've done a ton of videos, I've done a review on it. If you want to know what the F80 is like inside out, go watch my review. Um, that's a real owner's review. I uh, drove the shit out of it for uh, about a year. And uh, yeah, in my opinion, the M3 is almost like owning a Golf R and a Nissan GTR mixed into one car, you know? The GTR is definitely a, a faster, more capable car, but I definitely prefer the way um, the F80 drives, you know? Uh, you're definitely rewarded more. You know it's rear wheel drive. You know you're risking your life driving at whatever speed you're doing. It's just, yeah, man, you can't beat the experience of an M car. It's, it's all M cars. Um, it's a real manly feel you get from behind the wheel. It's not like your 235 eyes or your 135 eyes. I'm just saying that when you drive the M3, it's like you're in a real car now, do you know what I mean? It's a, it's a, it's a real sports car, you know? And so capable at the same time. Everybody mentioned about how this car was twitchy. Almost scared me out of buying it, but when I bought it, I found it the total, total opposite. I felt it super capable, wasn't twitchy one bit. Um, yes, if you put your foot down completely at low speeds, then of course it's gonna uh, spin up, you know? You're driving a car with 430 bhp, 400 foot-pounds of torque with twin turbos, you know, available from like 1800 rpm. You know, so many people that review it and they're like, oh, it's it's twitchy, and, and in my mind I'm like, the problem is, is that you're used to driving cars with all of this technology attached. Like, I'm used to growing, I've grown up around cars with no, like, I mean, I'm quite fairly young, but you go back to like some of the older people, there was no traction control, there was no stability control. It was just you and the car, do you know what I'm saying? There was no computers helping you. So when you've learned how to drive cars from those kind of errors where you have no safety nets, when you jump in an F80 M3, it's a dream to drive, trust me. Don't listen to people talking about how they're dangerous. Yes, they are, because, sorry, they can be dangerous if you can't drive, innit? Like, just being blunt, innit? It may come across a bit raw, but the point I'm trying to make is that these new cars, where they've got all of this technology, they take away, they're taking away uh, the element of driving, you know? You're not getting a real feel for your car. When I drove my F80, I knew what was going on with the car. That's why I could drive it with traction off. I knew when the car was going to kick, like I was connected to the car, I was an extension of the car, do you know what I mean? And it's something that you develop over years and years of driving, do you know what I mean? You can't just jump into an M3 uh, uh, without having any experience and you know, you, you don't like, any, anybody knows with big power car, you don't just mash the throttle anyway, yes, four wheel drive cars, RS6s, RS4s, uh, Audis, the Golf R, you mash the throttle, but it's not the same as when you, you get in a M135i or especially the M3, you know? You've got way more power, it's a lot more control uh, modulating with the throttle you've got to do. And uh, like I say, it's a lot more of a rewarding car. It's definitely, without fail, my number one car. Uh, yes, not as capable as the uh, Nissan GTR, but so much more rewarding, so much more smiles when you've 
uh, you know, you arrive home knowing that you're not dead. <laughs> but honestly, man, the uh, the F the, the F eighty, such a sharp, nimble, um, yeah, uh, real racing car, man. Uh, and at the same time, it's got the um, you know four doors. It's comfortable in long journeys. It looks beautiful. It's fuel efficient. There's so many reasons why you should buy an M3. Yeah. Sold the F80, and uh, for some of you that may be wondering why I'm now driving an older E92 M3, as I explained at the time when I sold the F80, it was more for financial reasons. It wasn't an upgrade or, uh, you know, no disrespect to the E92, uh, but it was more financial reasons. And uh, the reason being that um, trying to do YouTube full time means that you can't dedicate as much time to making money and things like that. So I'm truly trying to chase this YouTube as a long term thing, um, which means I've had to downgrade. Uh, I mean, the E92 is a brilliant car, don't get me wrong, but it's as simple as the F80 is a newer, more capable car. There's a lot more benefits to the E92. Uh, it's a way more involving drive, uh, you know, driving them uh, an f8 and an e92 back to back you you'll, you'll be sweating when you get home in the e92 the f8 is a little easier a little less effort to to do everything but um the e92 the engine sound and like someone mentioned the other day when i put up the post the the throttle response is on another level it's a way more natural feel from the wheel you know you can f you feel the road do you know what i mean um, even some people would say that even the e92 has lost its ways but when you compare it to the f80 it's such a more natural drive. You know, you know I'm into a, a, a super dynamic car and the F80 is on another level. It's got way more grip. It's got way more stability, which makes you feel so confident. Like I felt like Superman when I should drive my F80. You could do anything in that car, man. As long as you had a bit of car control, that car is the car to just go terrorize people in. It's faster, uh, you know, stage one tune, you're keeping up with GTRs. It's just a, a, an all round, it's, a, it's just a better car. I mean, I absolutely love my E92. Genuinely, like the engine sound is unbelievable. When you're changing gears at 8200 RPM, the last scrape and the last revs, and you change gears, the feeling is like no other. Not even the F80 can never match it, never. It's an immediate smile. Like Emma, my partner owns the M3 as well. She absolutely loves it, man. She loves revving it to the last rev and changing gear, like listening to the engine. And with convertible, hers is the E93. So with the roof down, it's a whole nother thing. You can actually hear the engine in a way you've never heard before. So you people that drive your E92 or your E90 M3s, when you drive a convertible and you hear the engine, it's, it's a sound you've not heard before. Definitely gonna do some other modifications on it, but I don't know what's going to happen, you know. I may keep it, may not keep it. Uh, sometimes I sit there and think, you know what, I need to get into an F80 M3. Um, but, you know, um, is what it is, man. Guys, I'm going to end the video there. I hope I haven't bored the hell out of you. I told you I'd wrap it on. I don't even know if I've made this a whole video or I've made a part one or a part two. But um, yeah, thank you for the suggestion for making this video. Definitely was a good idea. I'm going to leave it as that. So I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, remember to give the video a thumbs up if you did enjoy it and remember to subscribe if you're new to the channel check out some of my other content i drive a lot of crazy cars um, getting back to the joyride videos as well i actually filmed yesterday so trust me guys joy rides are all coming back i'm just gonna jump on this and um, find these hidden gems do you know what i mean that's what you guys want to see you want to see these nice cars getting driven hard you want nice cinematics i know what you want so guys i'm gone thank you for watching and i'll see you soon bye